Genesis 47 1-31, through the Bible. Chapter 47. Theme, Joseph's presentation of father and brothers to Pharaoh, Joseph promises Jacob burial in Canaan. We have seen how Jacob and all his family have arrived in the land of Egypt. Joseph, as a move of strategy, brought them into the land of Goshen. This actually was the richest land in that day, but right now they are in the midst of a famine and no land is very valuable to the owner at this particular time. We are going to find that this is the best chapter in the life of Jacob so far. Jacob doesn't appear in a good light when we first meet him in Scripture. In fact, not until he makes his trip to Egypt do we begin to see that he has become a man of faith. This chapter, more than any other, reveals that. The famine becomes more intense as it draws to an end. Although the people of the world are involved in this, Canaan and Egypt are the lands which are mentioned because they are the particular areas in the development of the story which is told to us here. Joseph has presentation of father and brothers to Pharaoh. Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh, and said, My father and my brethren, and their flocks, and their herds, and all that they have, are come out of the land of Canaan, and, behold, they are in the land of Goshen, Genesis 47 1. Joseph is going to present his father and his brothers to the Pharaoh of Egypt. He put them in the land of Goshen before he asked for a place for them. You can see the strategy in that. If they were already there, Pharaoh would be more apt to give them that land. After all, they would already be moved in and have unpacked their goods. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we, and also our fathers, Genesis 47 2-3. We saw that shepherds and cattlemen didn't get along in those days. Egyptians just didn't care for shepherds, neither did they care for shepherding. So that opened up an opportunity for the children of Israel to do something that the Egyptians would not want to do. They said moreover unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee, the land of Egypt is before thee, in the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell, in the land of Goshen let them dwell, and if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle, Genesis 47 4-6. Since shepherding was not popular for the Egyptians, Pharaoh needed someone to care for his cattle. Now Joseph presents his own father to Pharaoh, and this is really quite remarkable. I want you to notice that Jacob now stands in the best light in which we've ever seen him during our study of him. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father, and set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Genesis 47 7. Notice that it is Jacob who is blessing Pharaoh. He is beginning to live up to his name. He is a witness for God now. The lesser is always blessed of the greater, and Jacob blesses Pharaoh as a witness for God. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? Genesis 47 8. At this point, if Jacob were living by that old nature which controlled him at the beginning, he would have said, Well, Pharaoh, I am 130 years old, and I want to tell you what I have accomplished in my lifetime. I would like to tell you how I outsmarted my brother when I was a young fellow and how I became rich by outsmarting my father-in-law. And he could have bragged about his family, I've got 12 sons. He could have gone on and on. But Jacob is a different man now. Listen to him. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are an hundred and thirty years, few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage, Genesis 47 9. First of all, notice that he was 130 years old when he came down to the land of Egypt, and he will be 147 years old when he dies. Therefore, he will spend 17 years in the land of Egypt. I imagine that he was right on the verge of death one foot in the grave and the other foot on a banana peel, when he came down to Egypt. But the joy of finding Joseph alive and of being with him in Egypt prolonged his life seventeen years. Again, this audience with Pharaoh is an opportunity for the old man to boast, but notice how changed this man Jacob is. He says that he is 130 years old and his life is really nothing to brag about. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. He doesn't brag about pulling a trick on his old father. Instead, he says he doesn't measure up to his fathers. I have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Isn't this a changed man? 
It doesn't sound like the old Jacob, does it? He's giving glory to God for his life, and he is making no boast that he has accomplished a great deal. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and went out from before Pharaoh, Genesis 47:10. Frankly, my feeling is that Jacob has arrived. What an opportunity he has to boast, but he doesn't take advantage of it. Someone else might have thought, Pharaoh is a great ruler, but I want him to know that I was a pretty big man up yonder in the land of Canaan. But Jacob doesn't brag, he is just a sinner, saved by the grace of God. In our day we hear so much boasting on the part of many Christians. Sometimes in our own circles, we attempt to applaud certain men for what they have done. We talk about how great they are. Well, if we all told the truth, we would say that we are just a bunch of sinners and we haven't anything to brag about except a wonderful Savior who has been gracious and patient with us down through the years. He is all any of us have to boast about. Neither can we say that we are superior to our fathers. A friend of mine, who is now a seminary professor, told me how ashamed he had been of his dad. When he first went off to college, his dad was coming to that college to speak because he was a preacher and a Bible teacher. My friend said he was so ashamed of his dad that he wouldn't even go to the meeting where he spoke. He pretended to be sick so he would not have to go. He said, I was so ashamed of him that I didn't want to be known as his son. He spent four years in college and then went into the business world for a couple of years. He said, I had a rough time, and I changed my thinking about my dad. I had thought he was pretty stupid, but I realized that he had supported his family and had been an excellent Bible teacher. After I had experienced some rough times in the business world, I came home, and my, how my dad had improved. No one has ever learned as much as my dad had learned during those brief years I had been away from home. He came to the conclusion his dad was a lot smarter than he had thought him to be. Isn't that same kind of story true of many of us? But it is not true of Jacob here. He takes a humble place because he is a changed man now. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren, and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded, Genesis 47:11. The land of Ramesses is the land of Goshen. And Joseph nourished his father, and his brethren, and all his father's household, with bread, according to their families. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine, Genesis 47 12-13. The reason that only Egypt and Canaan are mentioned is because they are the two geographical locations which are involved in our story. If Jacob had remained in Canaan with his family, they would have perished. Grain had been stored in the land of Egypt, but the land is not producing grain anymore. Evidently the famine has spread all over Africa, because the Nile River is not overflowing, which is so necessary for Egypt's crop production. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt, and in the land of Canaan, for the corn which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house, Genesis 47:14. We are coming now to something for which Joseph has been criticized. People say he took advantage of poverty and he bought up the land. In other words, he closed in on the mortgages and bought the land. I feel that this is an unfair criticism of Joseph. To begin with, he is the agent of Pharaoh. None of this is for himself, he is making no effort to enrich himself. He was not crooked in any sense of the word. He did not gain personally because of the famine. An illustration of this is the scarcity of and demand for uranium during wartime in my own country. When some men found that they had uranium in their properties, especially in Arizona, they were paid handsome sums for their land. Were they taking advantage of their government? I don't think so. The law of, supply and demand was in operation. It seems to me that this same principle was in operation in the land of Egypt. Joseph bought the land for Pharaoh, and he is enabling the people to live by furnishing them food. I think that Joseph stayed within the confines of the law of supply and demand. And when money failed in the land of Egypt, and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph, and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle, if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses, and for the flocks, and for the cattle of the herds, and for the asses, and he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year, and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent, my Lord also hath our herds of cattle, there is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our bodies, and our lands, 
wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, and give, us seed, that we may live, and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's, Genesis 47 15-20. There is no doubt that the famine was a very terrible thing. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt even to the other end thereof, Genesis 47 21. There was a great migration into the urban areas so that they would be near the center of supply where the grain was stored. You remember that Joseph had chosen these centers throughout Egypt at the very beginning. He now brings the people where they will be close to the supply of food. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day in your land for Pharaoh, lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase, that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own, for seed of the field, and for your food, and for them of your households, and for food for your little ones, Genesis 47 23-24. Joseph knows that the famine will be ended the next year, so he tells the people to sow their grain. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives, let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's, Genesis 47 25-26. Joseph promises Jacob burial in Canaan. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein, and grew, and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years, so the whole age of Jacob was an hundred forty and seven years. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die, and he called his son Joseph, and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me, bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt, but I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me. And he swore unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head, Genesis 47 27-31. I think there are several factors which entered into Jacob's request to be buried back in the land of Canaan. First of all, he is now 147 years old, and he becomes alarmed that he will die in the land of Egypt. I think that is clear to him now. Then, the success of Joseph in acquiring all the land for Pharaoh makes him believe that his family might become comfortable in Egypt and never want to return to Canaan. His age certainly told him that he would die shortly. We need to recognize this request as an evidence of the faith of Jacob in the covenant which God had made with his fathers. We need to note this because it will come up several times as we go through the Bible. The hope of the Old Testament is an earthly hope. Abraham believed that he would be raised from the dead in that land, so he wanted to be buried there. Isaac believed the same. Now Jacob is expressing that same faith. You see, the hope in the Old Testament is not to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and enter the city of the New Jerusalem, which is the eternal and permanent abode of the Church. The hope of the Old Testament is in Christ's kingdom which will be set up on this earth. When that happens, Israel's great hope will be fulfilled, and these people will be raised for that kingdom. The first thousand years of it will be a time of testing, and after that the eternal kingdom will continue on and on. This is why Jacob does not want to be buried in Egypt. If he had no faith or hope in God's promise to him, what difference would it make where he was buried? For the believer today it makes no difference where we are buried. At the time of the rapture, wherever we are, we shall be raised, and our bodies will join our spirits, that is, if we have died before the rapture takes place. If we are still living, then we shall be changed and caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So it won't make any difference if we are buried in Egypt or in Canaan or in Los Angeles, or in Timbuktu. The living in Christ and the dead in Christ in all of these places will be caught up. It won't make any difference where we are. We don't need to go to a launching pad in Florida and take off from there. No, our hope is a heavenly hope. The hope of the Old Testament is an earthly hope and the fact that Jacob wants to be buried back in the land is an evidence of his faith in the resurrection. He hopes to be raised from the dead in the promised land. Jacob is now becoming a man of faith. 